week 159 of Brad is branded thoughts and from the Hawkeye of the storm we are here discussing uh, the NCAA tournament which is now complete uh, as well as some transfer portal news coming from uh, potentially the University of Iowa and certainly dozens hundreds of schools across the country the transfer portal is as active as it has ever been uh, and I'm joined by Jared Barger who uh, we're going to start our discussion this morning talking about that uh, NCAA championship between Gonzaga and Baylor. I think surprised a lot of people with uh, as dominant as Baylor was. The game was never really in doubt. Um, Gonzaga cut it to single digits a couple times, but it was not the type of game I think most people expected. A lot of people were talking about it being the best championship since the 2005 Illinois-North Carolina game, which lived up to the hype. Um what were your thoughts on Baylor's performance and uh, how does this change your view of Gonzaga? I don't think it changes my view of Gonzaga much uh, as far as like, they still had a hugely successful season, but I think the bottom line is Baylor was just the better team because they were tested in their conference and Gonzaga just really hadn't faced much of anybody until the tournament, you know, their biggest test every year is BYU pretty much, or, or maybe a few other teams that give them some trouble, but we knew they were a great team, but we didn't know for sure how they were going to match up because those two didn't get to play in the regular season. It was canceled. So uh, I don't think it surprised me too much. I mean, I could, I definitely thought Baylor was going to win. I didn't know they were going to win like that. I mean, they got off to a hot start and it really was never close. But I think I think it just it comes down to Baylor was tested more in the Big 12. It's not a great conference, but it's a solid conference. And, you know, they faced Oklahoma State and Kansas and Texas and all these teams. And so I think they got hot, really hot at the right time. And they're the best team in the country. So when you think about uh, how this tournament went down, first of all, hands off to uh, hats off, excuse me, to uh, everybody, all the folks in Indianapolis and Bloomington for getting this uh, together and making it happen and not having real any real issues. Really, the only issue we ran into from a virus standpoint was the VCU cancellation in the Oregon game, which, of course, looking back, I wonder how that would have changed Iowa's path to uh, the Sweet 16. Um, I don't know that VCU would have beaten Oregon, but we saw Oregon put up a pretty uh, dismal performance against the USC Trojans in the following game. Um, I don't want to spend time rehashing Iowa, Oregon. We've done that on the show. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a sad point of uh, uh, depression. But uh, when you look at what happened uh, with Fran, I do, I do want to touch on, on the program and the state of the program, because Alex, Brad and I were here just, a week or two, two ago talking about this very issue. Are you concerned at all? And you're a homer just like I am, but are you concerned at all with Fran's ability to take this team to the promised land, so to speak? Um, he's been to the tournament five times and he's 0 for 5 in getting them to the Sweet 16. Okay. He's 0 for 4 in the second round of the NCAA tournament. And you could kind of make the excuse in past years that they've seated themselves at a very difficult position where they've had to play the likes of Gonzaga, Villanova, Tennessee in the second round of, of, of tournaments. And of course that makes it difficult to make the sweet 16, but this is a year where they had the, the two seed locked up. They were playing a seven seed who I think was underseeded, but still listen, if I was a two seed, even if Oregon was underseeded, this is a game Iowa should have won. I don't think anybody can argue that. And not only did they not win, they got absolutely destroyed. They got pantsed. So are you concerned at all right now with, with Fran McCaffrey's ability to take them to that next level? Well, you know how I like to be an optimist when it comes to Iowa, but come on, if they, if he couldn't do it with that team, yes, I'm concerned. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so what, what, we don't want to make excuses for Iowa, but like you said, that was about the toughest second round draw they could have gotten. I mean, Oregon, just the whole Pac-12 really surprised people in the tournament with the way they played. And 
Wouldn't you have Again. rathered? Wouldn't you have rathered though play an Oregon team who had their first game canceled? Like I don't think people who say, "Well, what I thought Oregon was rested." I don't. I don't buy that. Everybody was rested coming into the tournament, but I mean, to See, me, you want to yeah. played somebody and you get a day's rest. Iowa got a day off after Grand Canyon. You get a day off. I, I just don't buy the idea that they were rested and that's why they were. They had so much more. I think they got beat. Iowa got beat because of lack of athleticism, lack of defense. The same thing we talk about. Every single time Iowa loses a game with this squad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's – well, and also it's just like, why can't they just score every time Oregon scores like they did in the first half, you know? But uh, <laughs> we're, we're not going to get – we're not going to get too far into this and, you know, start bringing up the well, it, bad I think thoughts, it was it, was it you that I texted and I, I said, you know – Oh yeah, you you called you you told me exactly what was going to happen. Well, you I said, did because you've because seen it. With I've seen it a million. Teams. Yes, mm -hmm. you, when you see this back and forth, and you're like, "Wow, I was hitting everything," but so is Oregon. Let me tell you something. I was hitting everything, and that's great. But every team is going to go through a drought. Every team is. Yeah. Now, the difference is Iowa doesn't have any semblance of a defense to stop a team like Oregon when it goes through a drought. So as soon as Iowa hits a dry spell, it's over. The game is over at that point. And I saw it coming a million miles away. And it's frustrating because, like you said, we see Iowa, how dynamic their offense is. Um, but they made Oregon look great. And then you have USC come back just to completely destroy the Ducks. And then you have Gonzaga completely destroy USC. And then you have Baylor completely destroy Gonzaga. <laughs> now, I know you can't play the, the transitive property in, in, in sports. But um, I, I, I don't know. It's 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 – I'm very happy for Luca Garza. We talked about it in the show last week. Very happy for him winning basically every major award, including the Naismith, including the Wooden, including the AP Player of the Year. Um, congratulations to him on those uh, awards. And I, I wish him nothing but the best at the next level. I think he's got a, a good shot at making an NBA roster. But um, I, I just – I'm to the point where the frustration with – I mean, because we talked about it earlier in the year – um, no matter what Iowa did in the regular season, you are not going to be deemed successful unless you can win in the tournament. Mm -hmm. And fair or not, that's college basketball. Um, and it, I don't think it used to be that way, but that's how it is here in the 21st century. Uh, and let's be honest, there's not really anything we can fall back on as far as what they did in the regular season because, yeah, they were 14 and six, but they finished fourth or, excuse me, third in the Big Ten. So they didn't win the Big Ten. They didn't. Uh, win the Big Ten tournament, didn't even make the championship the Big Ten tournament. Um, lost the biggest game of the season, arguably the biggest game of the season, by by double digits to Gonzaga. So what do you fall back on besides, well, they had a good record? Well, besides the personal accomplishments of 55, yeah. nothing. You don't have anything to. Uh, and I think it's still, still good for him. He came back. He was – Another year, the best player, and you know, this time he got all the major player of the year awards. So it's still good for him that he came back. It's still, but yeah, the fact they couldn't make the Sweet Sixteen, it's it's tough. It, did I don't you, know. Didn't you have him in the championship, or did you have winning? Did you have winning the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, why not? You know, it's like why not? Well, I, I had him go to the but Elite you know, Eight. So you know how we felt. I mean, they they were playing better defensively, and. It did look – they were 8-2 and two in their last 10 going in, and it did look like they were maybe peaking at the right time. So, well, Let's be honest. They they literally look like the team they did against Minnesota on the road earlier in the year um, against Gonzaga. They look like that same exact team couldn't stop – could not stop anything Oregon was doing. Mm -hmm. And that, that is what's frustrating. It's not that they just had a bad – it was an, it was like they didn't even show up uh, on the defensive end. So I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. Now, I want to transition a little bit to um, Bohannon. Jordan Bohannon um, announced this past week he would return if the NIL bill, the name image like this bill, were passed. It did not get passed last week. It's not going to be passed for the foreseeable future. Um, but the problem is – I won't say the problem, but – the the uh, thing about this, the asterisk on this conversation is the fact that he never addressed whether he would come back if it didn't pass. And so um, I, this is not an anti Bohannon show. Um, I, I, I talked about it again on our previous podcast. 
I am all for Bohannon coming back under the right circumstances. Uh, and I know you and I have talked. You're an adv- advocate for him coming off the bench. I'm just going to sit here and tell you right now, that's not happening. Fran's I know not, it's not. Fran's not doing that. Yeah, no. And so do you think he's coming back? I mean, it, given the – the because I, I, I didn't. I didn't uh, probably two weeks ago. I, I gave it about a .05 chance. Now I give it like a 50-50 chance. I really do because why would you be talking like – you're interested in this. I mean, and, and what's the, okay, say you want the NIL bill to pass this week. That's, that's just trying to use leverage, which Jordan Bohannon does not have enough leverage for lawmakers to change something. You know, it's just not going to happen that way. However, it could get passed and he could benefit next year from it. And knowing how Jordan Bohannon operates, uh, I think that's, I'm not criticizing it. It's, it's good or bad, but, uh, I would not be shocked to see him return. And um, look, I, I again, I like Jordan Bohannon. I think a lot of fans are ready for that era to be over. And my other fear is, and I said it on the podcast, my other fear is he, he if, if he returns for one year, you're going to miss out on the last two years of Joe Toussaint because I think he's gone. Um, and I don't know. I mean, Aaron Euless, Tony Perkins, I wouldn't think those guys would, would consider transferring, especially because Tony's a two. And Aaron, you know, he's going to be just a sophomore next year with four years of eligibility left. But um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on the, on the situation with Jordan? Well, I've gone back and forth, and it's tough because, yeah, it's like I, I like what you said there, that some fans just want the era to be over because, I mean, you can't take away what he's done. But the fact is he's just not the same player after after his injuries – and he can still shoot a three from anywhere. And that's a guy you do want on your team. So if if Fran had the guts to not put him in the starting lineup and he just came off the bench and shot some threes, I'd be fine with that. But I don't want to lose Joe Toussaint over Bohannon coming back because he, he's just too inconsistent and he's not he's not what they need to to lead them to anywhere. So at this point, at well, this he point. has, I mean, he's been here five years. Uh, and it's not, yeah. I'm not putting all the onus on him. Just like I wouldn't put all the onus on Garza. Um, but Bohannon's lack of defense is the epitome of what Iowa has been the last four or five years. And that yeah. that's sad. And, and I'm not saying it's for a lack of effort. I, I thought Bohannon really upped his effort defensively this year. I really do. Uh, if you look back mm-hmm. at tape, he, he, he was working hard, moving his feet, doing the best he could. He's just got a deficiency there and it's always going to be there. And so I look at it and I think, well, um, I, I don't see the backcourt defense getting much better as long as he's here because I think he's going to play 30, 35 minutes a game. I, I don't know why you'd come back if you're not, um, you know, if you're coming back to, to win a championship, uh, you, you, you're not going to come back. You, you came back last year for that. Okay. You're not coming exactly. back this year to win a championship. He's coming back this year to uh, potentially benefit from the name image likeness bill that could be passed into law here in Iowa. Again, don't know if that will happen, um, but he's not going to benefit from his name image likeness playing 15, 20 minutes a game. That's just not going to happen. So the backcourt defense is going to struggle as long as Jordan Bohannon's here. I, I, you know, I, again, not trying to criticize the kid. That's just a fact. Um, and I think, two, we found out after the season that Connor McCaffrey had two torn labrums, so he's going to be dealing with surgery. I wonder how his mobility is going to be coming back, um, if that's going to affect him defensively. He's never been a great defender either. Um, and uh, I just think, I think Iowa fans are ready to see a more defensive display. With that being said, let's talk a little bit about the portal because there has obviously been a, a – more than a laundry list full of names uh, from division two, II, division three, NAIA coming and trying to get into division one. And then of course, other division one players transferring. And we are expected to hear word from the NCAA here soon that they are approving a blanket waiver for everybody to be eligible immediately, which basically is free agency. Like we've never seen it before in college basketball. Um, so Looking at Iowa's potential options, first of all, Iowa did have a Zoom call, I believe, Tuesday with Philippe Rabracha, um, who is a foreign player. He uh, has been up at North Dakota up until now. Um, 6'9", good shooter, um, can shoot the three at about a 
35% clip, I believe. Um, he's got a good stroke. Uh, a little undersized, though. I mean, he's not going to be a five. I mean, th th I think people who think he's going to come in and replace Garza and Nunji, that that's not what he'd be coming in to do. And that's why I'm an advocate for France still going after a big, even if they can get Rebracha, which is obviously a huge if. But they did have a Zoom call with him. Um, and Rebracha said everything good that you'd want him to say. But again, he's going to say that about every school that he talks to. Yeah. Um, so you can't read into that too much. But you've looked at his tape. Um, what do you think he brings to Iowa if he does decide to head to Iowa City? He's got two years of eligibility remaining. Yeah, well, like you say, I mean, he's a great shooter. He's a great player. I like what I see from him. But right now I'm worried about somebody that can play the five. I mean, that's my top priority because they just don't have anybody really other than a gundale, but you know, <laughs> yeah. um, which, hey, listen, I, I, you there's and I potential both, there. You there's and I both agree there. though, that a gundale needs, I think he needs a year of being the backup, yeah. you know, and, yeah. it, and that, One didn't more year happen, that. that didn't happen this past year. Cause he wasn't physically in shape enough. And you're dealing with two big guys ahead of him most of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think they need a big guy now. Rebracha is a guy who I think can stretch the floor. So he's gonna be he's gonna bring a little bit of what Garza could bring in that respect. And he is a good post player. I think he's a guy who can play the five in smaller lineups. I'd rather him playing the five than Keegan. Okay. Not because yeah. I, I think yeah. he, Keegan just to me, Keegan is a perfect four in Iowa's system. And Rebracha certainly could play the four, but I think he could play the five in smaller lineups. So I think you could get away. If Ogundale is back uh, and healthy, I think you could get away with Ogundale and Rebracha playing the five together while also still playing Rebracha at the four. But that's still going to put a lot of minutes on Josh Ogundale. And so now the, the discussion yeah. is, can Fran go after somebody who is a high major five? Uh, you know, of course, the kid from North Carolina, Kessler. He's a guy everybody's after right now, seven-footer. Uh, I think he'll probably end up going to Kansas or yeah. Gonzaga. By the way, Joe, We're not <laughs> Joe, uh, Joe Yusefu from uh, – or am I pronouncing that right? Yesefu. There you go, Yesefu from Drake uh, has committed to Kansas. Huge get for Kansas, big loss for Drake. Drake has now lost two tremendous players in the course of two years between Joe Yusef, uh, Yesefu and Liam Robbins. Uh, imagine what Drake could have been with Yesifu and Robbins back next year, um, we're talking uh, top 25 Drake Bulldog squad again, and I think they were top 25 most of this year, at least from my estimation, even playing in the Missouri Valley. But besides the point, you've got uh, Kessler probably going to a, to a, a Blue Blood school. Um, there are a lot of fives available, not as many as you'd think, though, especially guys who are going to be able to play in the Big Ten and replace a guy like Garza. Um Obviously, the big name right now being tossed around is Liam Robbins. His name was being tossed around weeks ago before he even entered the portal. He announced two days ago that he is in the transfer portal. And we just got word that Fran McCaffrey has reached out to Liam Robbins. So that is good news. Uh, what that means is yet to be seen. I think Liam Robbins, given the fact that he averaged 12 points in like, what, six or seven rebounds a game at Minnesota, I think he can go basically anywhere he wants. Um, and maybe I'm wrong on that, but when he was transferring from Drake last year, uh, I think his options were somewhat limited. And I think he primarily wanted to go play for his, his uncle Ed Conroy up at, at Minneapolis. And now it looks like Conroy is on his way out. Um, potentially I've heard rumblings uh, of him getting hired at Vanderbilt. Um, so maybe Vanderbilt gets in the mix for, for Robin's services, but Robbins is a seven footer who can shoot threes is a much better defender than you'd think. To me, this is a, a match made in heaven, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. for Iowa. And I didn't realize this yep. either. He is a guy with two years of eligibility remaining. Um, I wasn't even thinking about that. He was a junior this year. And so with the um, extra year awarded to uh, players that played during the COVID year, um, he could come back for two years. Uh, I'm not saying he would, but he could. How big would it get? I mean, first of all, how does he fit into the system in your, in your estimation and how big of a get would this be for Fran? Well, huge. I mean, to me, that's a, that should be the top priority. Uh, as far as how he fits in, I mean, I think anybody that's seven foot with his skill set is going to fit in just about anywhere, but he's not Garza. 
he's not necessarily a, a guy that's going to post up a whole, as much necessarily. I mean, I don't think does Minnesota look for him in the post as much as I think it's hard to tell because Marcus Carr, everything ran through Marcus Carr, mm-hmm. and which he's he's out too. Minnesota's yeah, Minnesota's losses. They've got a complete turnover uh, yeah. overhaul battle there, but they've gotten some some. Uh, there've been some juice as far as recruiting and, and transfer portal action for them as well. Now I don't think Robbins is a guy who's necessarily a Garza. I mean, who is a Garza no. really from an offensive standpoint, but he is a guy who can shoot threes really well. And he is a darn good rim protector. And I'm telling yeah. you, he comes in along because you know, Keegan Murray starting next year. So oh, yeah. imagine Keegan and Robbins in the front court, your front court goes from being pretty, un- I mean, think about it. Connor McCaffrey, because Connor's not starting at the four next year. There's no way you can start Connor at the four when you have Keegan Murray doing what he does. So uh, I think Connor will probably start, but it'll probably be at the one or the two. Um, if it, that's if Weiss Camp comes back, I could see him start. He can start basically any spot besides the five. So I see Connor probably at the one or the two, unless Weiss Camp comes back, he's at the three. But that front court now with Keegan and Robbins compared to last year with with uh, McCaffrey and Garza, goes from being one of the worst defensive front courts in the Big Ten to being maybe the best with Robbins and Murray. And I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. Um, defensively, uh, how much better would Iowa be just with the addition of Liam Robbins? A lot better. I mean, Keegan can hold his own. Just having Keegan as a starter already – uh, makes it a lot better. And then you add Liam Robbins. Yeah, that's quite a turnaround. And, you know, all like all the love in the world, the Bohannon and Garza, but I'm really excited for, for just a new, just a new look of Iowa basketball, you know, just, just something different. Cause I'm, I'm tired of not playing any defense and they're not going anywhere without playing any defense. So I'm excited for a new look. And if they were to be able to pull that off and get him, that would make their team tremendous and not where they were last year, but. Oh, th- like, listen, if Robbins comes back, if, if Robin comes and it's a huge, if, I mean, we, we don't even have any indication that Robbins is interested. I mean, we have no indication of that now. I know he's, a it dev- just seems like it, it should, but <laughs> you, you would think so. But you know, guys enter the portal. It's like Jack Nungy's announcement guys enter the portal for specific reasons sometimes. And it may not have anything to do with what, just wanting to get out of Minnesota. It may have to do with him wanting to be where his uncle is. Um, it could be, he wants to just get out of the big 10 and have a change. I don't know. Could be. Um, and you can't judge the kid either way, but. I will say this, if Robbins somehow, if, if Iowa can get Robbins to commit and he ends up being a Hawkeye next year, regardless of what else Iowa does in the portal, regardless of what Iowa does in the portal, if Wieskamp comes back and Robbins is here, um, Iowa was a, a two seed in the tournament this year. They are a, I'm going to try to not be crazy here. They are a three or four seed next year. And that's, Agreed. I would have, I would have said without Garza and Bohannon, um, maybe we skip coming back, maybe a, a six next year, a six seed, seven seed. Um, they're definitely a tournament team. I think without we camp, I think, you, you know, then you're talking, you know, I still think they're a tournament team, but I, yeah. it's, it's, I don't know. Uh, but those are two big ifs, we camp and Robbins um, being at Iowa next year. I really think Wieskamp is going to come back. And I know he really wants to play in the NBA, but I think he needs a year being the guy, being the leader on the team. And I think that's really going to do a lot for his draft stock because I don't know if he'd get drafted uh, if he were to declare this year. I, I agree. I you know Earlier in the year, he was really rolling. And I, I said at one point, I thought, I said, you know, Wieskamp is an NBA player because of the fact that he was shooting the three at such a high clip. And uh, I look at guys like, well, and he Duncan. still is, but he, he is. Uh, but I think, I think he slowed down a bit later in the year, um, which doesn't help his draft stock much. Um, when I look at guys in the NBA, like Duncan Robinson, uh, Matt Thomas, um, these are guys that like, I, I, you know, I would have never guessed Duncan Robinson to be an NBA player ever. 
And, um, you know, he's been a steady NBA player. Matt Thomas, you can argue, has been a pretty steady NBA player. Um, same thing with him. I would have never guessed that he'd play in the NBA someday. So there are guys that uh, can play that style. It'd be a three and D guy in the in 2021 style NBA basketball and, and make it. So, but the problem is, I agree with you. I have not seen Wieskamp's name very high on draft boards. So I don't know what point, you know, I know some guys want to go the whole G league route and, you know, try to yeah. try to make their way in the NBA that way. Um, most G league guys aren't going to make a lot of money. I mean, you're going to make maybe 60, 70,000 a year. Um, I know some guys can make triple figure or six figures that way, but um, you got to be pretty darn good for that. So I, 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 I wonder with what Wieskamp's got going through his mind, if the decision has been made or if he's waiting on certain variables. Um, my guess is what he'll do is he'll do what he did his freshman year and he will declare um, without an agent and, and leave that possibility open kind of like Garza did last year. So that's a big, if I would definitely think that he would at least slightly be affected if Iowa could get a, a big fish in the transfer portal, whether it be Robbins or, um, I think Rebracha is a pretty would be a pretty good get. I think Minnesota's after him. Virginia Tech, I think, was after him as well. So, you know, he's a guy that uh, some high major teams are, are are going after. So, you know, there's lots of different options. I mean, it's not just those two guys. Again, 1,200 or so players have uh, entered the transfer portal. Miles Johnson, the, the big guy from Rutgers, is in the transfer portal. So, there's guys everywhere. Uh, Minnesota's got a second big man. I think it is it Mashburn or. Um, I can't remember the big guy from Minnesota that entered the portal. And I think he's like six ten. So now I know who you're talking about, but that would not be, that would really tick off Iowa fans. If Iowa ends up getting Mashburn instead of, and, 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 and they don't get Robbins. Like, well, I'll take anybody at this point though. I mean, yeah. really just somebody in there, but, but I yeah. think Robbins is a guy, especially with two years of eligibility that if he were to come here, he could somewhat change the, um, the mantra here, uh, they're still going to, they're still going to run. They're still going to, you know, score a lot of points, but it's kind of how, what Adam Woodbury did. Everybody wanted to insult Adam Woodbury when he was at Iowa, but the guy played defense and like, that's why we didn't complain much about their defense from 2000, you know, 13 to 2016, because Adam Woodbury, you know, Jared Utah, those guys were, were huge and uh protecting the rim blocking shots and uh you know then you got anthony clemens who's a very good defender that class was so underrated and i think they've really suffered since then so it's not a direct result of bohannon being here but he he's kind of a microcosm of the bigger issue um tyler cook was a it, it just goes to show you athleticism doesn't always translate into defense i know certain, certain people want to just point at iowa's athleticism tyler cook was a great athlete and a pretty mediocre defender at Iowa. Um, Wisconsin has a lot of guys who are very non-athletic from a, a Division One standpoint, and yet they're one of the better defensive teams in the Big Ten year in and year out. So it comes down to coaching, and it comes down to schematics, and uh, I, I, I just don't know if Fran – it doesn't seem like Fran has what it takes or has the humility to know that he needs extra help because he's refused to bring on anybody in the staff that is defensive minded. You see what John Beeline did at Michigan. He brought in the best defensive coach, the guy from uh, Northern Illinois and brought him in to basically coach defense. And what, what has Michigan done? They've made final fours, elite eights, national title games. So it works. And I, and, but I, I wonder if Fran has the humility to accept that. And I don't think there's going to be any, I mean, Sherm Dillard's probably the next guy out. Uh, just because of retirement and his age. I don't know when Sherm wants to retire. I, I don't know Sherm personally, but um, there's probably not going to be an opportunity to hire anybody else. They had that opportunity two years ago and Fran went with Billy Taylor. Um, and, and I like Billy. Billy seems like he's got a, a good track record. Seems like a good guy, but um, I don't know. I just think Fran needs help. And I think the only way he's going to get help at this point, because he's not going to hire somebody that can coach defense better than he can. I think, the biggest help he can get is by getting defensive players um, yeah. like Robbins or, you know, somebody of the like. Cause that really does rub off on the team. I mean, you've got a lot of guys that have potential to be good defensive players, or at least they can, you know, hold their own. They're not a liability, 
But just bringing one guy in that plays solid defense or even really good defense can make everybody around him better, just like Garza did with the offense. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think people, one guy that people aren't talking about much is Chris Murray. I mean, people don't realize yeah. the guy is long, athletic. He's just like his brother. He's like the same height. They're identical twins. There's the same height. He's probably got very similar uh, athletic attributes that Keegan does. Now, I'm not saying he's going to be half the player that Keegan is, but um, he could be a huge difference maker. Imagine having two mm-hmm. Keegan Murrays out there. Yeah, I was I mean, gonna say that's that's what it's like. It's like it's like having another one. I mean, he didn't get his playing time last year, but this year put him in there. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe you're the same player. Maybe it's like I think he'll both pl- I think he'll play a lot this next year. I do. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll see. I I I don't want you know. I know this was supposed to be attorney wrap up show, and we're kind of talking about Iowa more, but uh, that's it is what it is. Um, it's wherever it leads us. Yeah. The, the portal is going to be an interesting storyline again, Rebraca or Liam Robbins. I'd love both. Um, I think that would seal up the front court. Um, if we leaves, I think they could use another shooter. Um, True. if he leaves, but if he doesn't leave, if he's back, I think that, I think they're fine where they're at as far as mm-hmm. getting Rebraca and Robbins. I believe that would be, I think that'd be their max uh, on scholarship players, but I'd have to look at the scholarship count. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, and then of course, next year, Iowa gets Riley Mulvey, uh, the seven footer. So he would, you know, Robin's being here for potentially two years, but at least um, give Mulvey an extra year to develop if he needs it. So th- there are positives in this, uh, but uh, again, a lot of question marks as well. Uh, anything else you'd like to add about the tournament? Um, UCLA, I mean, you got to tip your hats to them. They, I mean, I, I had them losing in the first four to Michigan State, and they nearly did. I mean, Michigan State should have won that that game. Michigan State collapsed. You know, I mean, people forget Michigan State completely collapsed in that game against the Bruins to blow that thing. And uh, it just goes to show you. I said it before. The tournament's all about matchups and draw. And UCLA very easily could have lost that first game to Michigan State. Instead, they go to the Final Four. Yeah, yeah, and. I mean, a lot of people, so I've got my, I filled out what was happening on this bracket just so we can look back. And <laughs> uh, so I got, you know, they, they match up with Abilene Christian in the second round. And a lot of people, when they went to the sweet 16, were like, oh, come on, you know, they're going to get, I, I heard a lot of people say that Alabama was just going to crush them in the sweet 16. Then they go out and beat Bama. Then it's like, no way they beat Michigan. No way. It's like Michigan got an easy path to the Final Four. I don't know. Then they go beat Michigan. When you look at teams like this, it's like, how have they not been that good all year long? You know, like Johnny Juzang, I mean, I'd heard of him, but I didn't know how good he was until the tournament. Yeah. Uh, Tiger Campbell, which I didn't even know. I don't know if you're listening. One of the Whenever they start televising the player introductions, like in the Final Four, they said he's from Cedar Rapids. Apparently, he was born in Cedar Rapids. Oh, okay. And who's this again? Tiger Campbell, the you know the guy with the crazy hair for UCLA. That's the okay. Guard. He's from Cedar Rapids. He he was born in Cedar Rapids. He went to high school okay. in Indiana, but interesting. Yeah, but uh, I think UCLA is going to be one of the top basketball programs year in and year out going forward because I really like Mick Cronin as a coach. Um, and I'm honestly surprised Iowa beat Cincinnati back a couple years ago. Like, I think Mick Cronin's a really good coach. And Juzang's probably going to end up in the NBA. But they've got a – UCLA's got a lot of their players returning. So I think they're going to be one of the top programs moving forward. But as far as the tournament as a whole, just – it's March. That's all I got. You just – you can't – there like were, it, it, okay, let me ask this: Who is a better team, Illinois or UCLA? Okay, like well, you should, this shouldn't be this shouldn't be hard. Illinois, Illinois is a better team, but I mean, this is I, I, that, that's why it's frustrating the narrative that surrounds the NCAA tournament year in and year out. It's like if you fail in the NCAA tournament, you failed as you know you failed yeah. as a program, and that's why it's frustrating with Iowa because like. Illinois was a better brother team all year than, than 
UCLA. I would even venture to say they're a better team all year than Houston. Like Houston didn't play anybody against yeah. the Final Four. I mean, they really didn't. No, all double digit seeds. All so, double digit seeds. I, listen, yeah. I, I get it. They were a two seed, but they played in the AAC. Um, it's it's just frustrating that you have teams like Ohio State, Illinois, Iowa that all bowed out. Um, and I, I UCLA made or uh, excuse me, Illinois bowed out in the second round just like Iowa did. So you know, mm-hmm. I. I it's just it is it's frustrating that stigma that, that kind of is attached to teams that lose early in the tournament um now i will say this i agree with you on the ucla thing that, that they're going to be a better a pretty high program moving forward but i think there was a little bit of, of uh overreaction to what they did from pe- some people in the media i saw andy katz uh ranked ucla as his uh well he called it his power ranking preseason i know he he you know, he does power rankings and then they, he compares them to AP polls, whatever. But he called them his power ranking number one next year, preseason. They are oh. not the number no. one team in the country. I mean, come on. People, you yeah. realize that they were an 11 seed? I mean, I get it. Juzang played great in the tournament. The kid from Cedar Rapids, Campbell, they, they were great. I mean, this team deserved what they did. But again, look at their body of work. They are not, they are not a preseason top five team. And maybe you put them in the top 10, 15, but we got to pump the brakes a bit and realize that teams can just get hot at the right time. And that's exactly what happened with UCLA. Yeah, for sure. But I don't know. There was something about them that was just different from, from some of the other teams in this bracket that made runs as underdogs or just in previous years. I mean, I, I had never seen anything like it, really. I, what UCLA did, and yeah, it doesn't mean they're going to be a top team next year. It no, they got hot at the end, um, but for them, I don't think you can look at it and say they made it that far because of their matchups. No, I I agree with you. Um, they did prove themselves as I mean they've got tons of. I think I almost think that they underperformed in the regular season to be an eleven mm-hmm. seed. Um, now again, I, were we reading the PAC 12 wrong all, all year? I think, you know, some people want to argue that. And the thing about I it wasn't. is, well, a I lot said of, I've... a lot of people were saying, a lot of people are saying now that the big, I saw, I think it was maybe Andy Katz. Uh, he's got like four, uh, big 10 teams in the top 10 preseason next year. I mean, seriously, look, I, I think that's a little bit, you got to have some balance here. And uh, again, you don't want to completely read into what happened in the tournament, but the big 10 was terrible in the tournament. They were yeah. terrible. Um, now I think it was a bit of a fluke. I really do. Uh, Purdue is going to be great next year with Edie and Ivy. Those two guys. Um, yeah. They, they may be the best team, in the big 10 next year, in my honest opinion, um, Michigan state, you and I were talking last night about this. If, if a money Bates ends up coming this year, uh, which sounds like it's a possibility yeah. if he cl- reclassifies that turns into, and they've got another top 20 guy as well. And in the class of 2021, that turns into the two, probably the favorites nationally for the big 10. Um, and Michigan's going to return a lot as well. I did see Mike Smith declared for the draft. It doesn't sound like he's going to be uh, coming back to Ann Arbor. So that affects Michigan, but they do get back Hunter Dickinson. Um, I don't know if Shondi Brown is returning. I don't know how much eligibility he had left or if he's, going to be trying to go pro but uh and same well, thing with i don't care who's on the michigan roster they're going to be good because of Jawan howard i mean yeah. what he's doing as a coach like people forget he's only been here for a year basically two yeah. years but well and then you got indiana bringing back trace jackson davis i saw they got a commit commitment out of a pretty high major kid uh, i believe it was yesterday uh mike woodson the new head coach there is uh kind of continuing that former player turn coach trend um the same one that juan johnson's kind of started um and so uh, it'll be interesting to see what indiana does and then the, the guy up at uh, minnesota ben johnson has gotten a lot of i get I, I know he's got he's lost a lot uh marcus carr hasn't decided where he's going yet but uh, he's lost a lot of talent but he's also brought in a lot so i i have no doubt the big Ten's going to be really good this year uh but or next year um but I will say that the, they've got something to prove because this tournament performance was really pathetic. Um, and to get, not get anybody in the final four, that's just not a good look. 
No, it's not. With with four top two seeds, yeah. Yeah. But I think you're right. I mean, you just look you look through. It's like Wisconsin. They won their first round game. They lose to Baylor. Purdue got embarrassed, but just all the teams that Big Ten lost to, none of them are really other than Ohio State. Other than Ohio State to Oral Roberts in the first round, none of those losses. Well, hold on are, a second, though. Purdue lost to North Texas. Or that's true. Those two. Those two. <laughs> so I mean, other than I mean, those first two, yeah. But I, you look at the others. None of them are incredibly embarrassing. Well, it's Illinois just, did they lose. All to, happened. But Illinois did lose to Loyola. I mean, I get it. Loyola has I mean, proven themselves in the tournament. Yeah, but, you don't want to uh, play that team. Yeah, but the way they lost, I think, was really pathetic. The fact that Kofi Coburn couldn't do anything against the big, um, tumbling yeah. white guy, whatever his name is, Cameron Cameron Krutwig. Krutwig, yeah. yeah. I, I the fact that Coburn kind of got destroyed by him is really pathetic. So did Desumo. Um, yeah, he got true. like three or four steals off of him. Yeah. I, 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 so yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, I will. I do think it's going to be interesting to see next year once the transfer portal stuff is is figured out if the big 10 is looking as strong as we think it is, because again, they are losing Marcus Carr. The big 10 is losing. Well, we don't know that Marcus Carr is going to end up out of the big 10, but most likely losing Probably. Marcus Carr. You're going to lose uh, a lot of guys from Penn state. Um, you're going to lose a lot of guys from Rutgers. Um, uh, the Mathis kid at, at Rutgers has entered the portal as well. Um, you know, I, I, Gio, I saw Geo Baker declared for the draft. So there's going to be quite a turnover and, you know, it, it will be interesting to see, especially without Osumu and Coburn, what Illinois is next year. They also lost Adam Miller. He announced he's entering the transfer portal. So now again, some of these kids could return after entering the portal. It is possible to do that. Um, Iowa loses Jack Dungey, Garza, Bohannon, we think. Um, and uh, they also lost Michael Bear and um, what's the other kid, Austin Ash, that both transferred Austin out. Ash. Yep. So, uh, uh, best wishes to those kids. Hopefully they can go somewhere and play. But uh, all right, let's uh, let's kind of wrap this thing up. I want to talk. We've kind of recapped the tournament a bit. I do want to discuss spring football a little bit more. Uh, we got some uh, interviews yesterday with uh, Raymond Braithwaite, the uh, replacement of Chris Doyle and the weight room for Iowa. We, we heard from Ken O'Keefe. We heard from um Phil Parker, the defensive coordinator, who I think is one of the best in the business. I do want to hone in on, on some of the, the discussion with Ken O'Keefe, though, um, because it's what people want to talk about, especially in the spring, and that is the battle at quarterback. Uh, Spencer Petrus, we saw him last year take steps later in the year. It seemed like his development was slow, but he did miss spring practice and had a really weird fall camp. And O'Keefe has sworn by the fact that this is uh, an open competition. Um but Petrus is the guy right now, and uh, Deuce Hogan and or Alex Padilla would have to prove otherwise. Um, in your mind, is there anything that those two guys can do at this point to dethrone Petrus? Or is this sort of, um, you know, either either te Petrus tears a, a, tear, tears a knee, tears a labrum, or, or he's going to be the starting quarterback? Yeah, I don't think there's really anything those guys bring to the table that substitutes for experience. Just the fact he's already had a year in the system, and I don't think they're going to go plug somebody else in there. And I mean, because do we really want to do those first two games all over again? No, I think they were rolling. Well, I mean, they really we, they were rolling. They, they were had, well. The problem is though, those first two games, you could argue. Um, look, I I know there were fumbles in the first game against Purdue. And um, I think the coaching was really bad in the second game. Making the Petrus, Northwestern game, it was yeah, the play making, calling. Making Petrus throw 51 times uh -huh. when in the when wind. You, you're, yeah. Well, and they were up 21 nothing, or excuse yeah. me, they were up they were up 17 nothing, and uh, then they got outscored. Was it uh, 20? I believe it was 23 to three after that. So it was 23 to 20, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but let's remember, Peters threw three picks in that game and was really bad those first two games and really didn't get going until like second half Illinois and then the Wisconsin game. And then, of course, had the Michigan and, and uh, Missouri games uh, canceled due to COVID. So uh, um, how big of a jump do you see Spencer taking in this spring? 
Well, I don't know. I I like what I see from him. In fact, he went to uh, Jared Goff's high school, broke all his yeah. records. So the potential's there. Um, I'm not saying he's going to be an NFL quarterback, but the potential's there to to be a solid player. And he is losing some weapons, but also getting some weapons back and some new really highly recruited wideouts. Uh, so I think the focal point for Iowa, though, is it's going to be the run game, of course. And I, I see them being a run-first offense. And as far as Petrus goes, he just needs to kind of trust himself, make the easy throw, not try to do too much, not try to – because I, I think sometimes on short routes – he just tries to – seems like he just tries to laser that ball, and he just needs to settle down a little bit. But he got he got going. He hit his rhythm a little bit in the second half, and when they're running the ball, when they're running for over 100 yards, it makes him look a lot better too because then the throws he makes are to open guys. And so who knows? I mean, I could see this team going places next year. So when you look at the schedule, I know uh, we've spent time on the show breaking down the Iowa schedule, um, but given the fact that Iowa doesn't have to play Ohio State, but they do open with Indiana and Iowa State, there isn't the time this year, uh, just like there wasn't time last year because you played Purdue and Northwestern right off the bat with no non-conference due to COVID, there is not the time for Petrus to struggle. Uh, Mm -hmm. So he's got to come out of the gates locked, loaded, ready to go. He's going to be playing at home against Indiana, and then it gets a raucous crowd. It's going to be at least 50% capacity in Ames is my prediction. At least I would, would be shocked to see it full, be, given the fact that vaccines are heading out quickly. And we've got, what, four months, and then we're going to be, um, I mean, who knows where we'll be by then, hopefully in a very good spot from a vaccine and, and virus standpoint. But I think you're going to get a full stadium, most likely at Jack Trice. He's going to have to be locked and ready to go. Um, against two very good defenses. I mean, Iowa State's defense has turned into one of the better defenses, maybe the best in the Big 12. Yeah, which isn't saying a lot, but it's still saying something. And, Ed, you know, Brees Hall coming back, right? So, yeah. I don't know how I feel about that Iowa State game. I really don't, but... What, what do you look at when you look at running back? Um, you lose Makai Sargent. Um, you do get back Ivory Kelly Martin. Martin uh, dealt with a surgery here not that long ago, but it sounds like he's getting back to where hopefully he can uh, be ready to go this fall. I don't know that he's playing this spring, but that will give some more reps for guys like Gavin Williams, um, maybe to solidify a third spot. Iowa has a history of having running backs get hurt during the course of a year. Um, so, uh, Tyler Goodson, a huge onus is going to fall on him to stay healthy and be able to carry the ball, I think 20 to 25 times a game. And you hope that Ivory Kelly Martin can take another five to 10. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds right to me. Uh, I mean, last year it was like, it was good that we were able to have Sergeant in there, but I'm really looking forward to Goodson being the guy because I like him a lot what I've seen from him I think I was incredibly fortunate to have him and he's a guy that can rush for thousand yards he could I mean if they continue to feed him so yeah I like Goodson as the guy but then it'll be nice yeah you also have to have have guys to come in and carry the ball a few times too you know when he's not in there but yeah if he can stay healthy like you say, it's going to be a really good year for him. So wide receiver, I think, is my biggest question on offense. Um, Tyro and Tracy, Nico Regani are the guys that come back along with Charlie Jones. Max Cooper, I mentioned him last week on our, on our show. Um, he's a guy I think nobody's talking about. He did end up on the two deeps, which I know don't mean that much early on here. But you really do have four guys that have experience. So it's not like there's a total decimation of experience at wide receiver. But yeah. nobody has really emerged as a guy who's a, a big play. Um, to me, I, I mean, look, Tyrone Tracy can – There's, I'm not saying he can't make big plays, but he's not the big guy like Smith or even Smith-Marset had some size at 6'1 um, that I think they need. Keegan Johnson from Nebraska, Ken O'Keefe uh, – or excuse me, um, 
I believe it was uh, Brathwaite. Was it Brathwaite or maybe some of the players yesterday uh, on Tuesday that talked about Keegan Johnson's development? Um, he has really stood out so far a, a week into spring practice. Um, I think a crucial key to this offense next year is can you get a guy like Keegan Johnson or maybe it's Arlen Bruce or maybe it's Brody Brecht who's coming in at Ankeny. Get one of these guys to develop at wide receiver. Now, Arlen Bruce is not – uh, Brandon Smith. He's under six foot. He's more of a slot guy. I was got two of those guys already in Regani and Tracy that to me, they need someone to develop um, at that X receiver spot. Um, if they get that, I like where Iowa's offense is because I think Petrus has the, like you said, the arm that, that certainly if it, given the time can develop into um, a prolific passer. Um, where is the biggest weakness on this team? Because I said it to Alex here a couple of weeks ago. I don't see a, gaping hole anywhere which i again his him playing devil's advocate was he doesn't see a real strong he doesn't see a real big strength anywhere on this team which is kind of different than in past years um i would say the one big question mark on offense is wide receiver the one big question mark on defense is defensive line but my big thing is phil parker always seems to reload a defensive line that's never an issue um and wide receiver you may say that they you know, it's a weakness. However, you still bring back two really experienced guys along with two other semi-experienced guys. Yeah. And those are the two, like when you, when you start saying that, those are the two things that I thought of immediately too, is on offense, wide receiver on defense, it's the line, but defense, there's no need for concern. You're in and you're out. You know, they've got their guys that are standouts. Then they leave. Then it's like, okay, where are we going to be? Is it going to be as good this year? It always is. Phil Parker does a tremendous job no matter who's – and they've got a lot of guys on defense returning. But even the absence is whoever, whoever is put into that spot, you can be assured they're, they're ready, they're, they're developed, they know what they're going to do, and they're going to do it at a high level, whoever's going to be in that defense. So I'm not really worried about that. Just as far as the wide receivers – There's experience there. There's talent, definitely. Can they get consistent play, consistent receiving? You know, not a guy that he catches six passes one game and then disappears for a couple weeks. Somebody that can be reliable anytime. But if somebody can step up in that role, I don't see a clear weakness. I think it's just a really balanced football team for sure. Josiah Miamin, uh, Luke Lachey are a couple not, uh, tight ends to keep your eye on um, if they can develop because uh, they did lose Sean Byer. Uh, Sam mm-hmm. Laporta will be back. Um, we know the storylines in the offensive line. You lose Alaric Jackson, you lose Callen Berger, but you get back Ants, you get back Britt, you get back um, certainly Linderbaum and Jack Plum uh, are big gets. Um, and then linebacker, people are really excited about Seth Benson, um, Jack Campbell. Justin Jacobs, Dane Belton returns at safety slash cash. Jack Kerner, Kayvon Merriweather, Riley Moss, Matt Hankins, they're all back. Um, Monty Potabom is back at fullback. Yeah, I, I I say it every year, but I, I will I mean it this year that I don't see a huge weakness anywhere. And again, um, I, I've I've said in the past, well, I'm worried about this on defense, or I'm worried about this on defense. And every year it just seems like Iowa's defense reloads. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see how the spring progresses. It would be great to hear that Keegan Johnson has continued and really has taken that next step forward. Cause I could see him being um, a guy who plays a lot. And I think if Iowa can become a team, you know, last year they weren't going to be that team because of how um, I wouldn't say dominant, but at least uh, the, the big playability of Brandon Smith and Amir Smith Marset, you were not going to see a lot of guys rotating in at wide receiver, but I do feel like if, if this team wants to be a team that uh, is high powered enough to be able to throw the ball down the field and to be able to beat teams through the air, if, if needed, if need be at times, which I think every year there seems to be that game where you just wish, boy, I wish Stanley or Petrus or somebody could open things up a bit against this defense. That's basically just loading the box every time and, and stopping. Iowa's run the old fashioned way. Um, they're going to need to rotate guys in at receiver and they're going to need to have more than two or three guys. And that's why I think it's big, the development again of, of Bruce and Keegan Johnson and Brody Brecht, who I didn't hear much about during this week's press conferences. Maybe 
Um, he's not even, I don't even know if he's here yet. I'm assuming he is. Arlen Bruce is here, but I don't know that Brody is, is enrolled yet. I guess I'd have to look in and I didn't do the extra research before our show, but somebody, if somebody can emerge there uh, to compliment Tracy and Regani, um, it sounds like Charlie Jones is really looking good. And like I said, Cooper's on his fifth year. He returned for a fifth year. So I would expect him to, uh, to be a factor. I'm liking uh, what this team looks like. Um, and I'm already, this sounds really stupid. All right. It sounds really stupid, but I am very excited for September, um, which again, sounds very dumb and very in the moment because uh <laughs> We just got done with uh, March Madness, and uh, the NBA is still going. The MLB is 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 going as well as the uh, well golf was going. But I tell you, I've lost a lot of interest without Tiger uh, on the tee box. I hope he can get back as quickly as possible. Um, but yeah, we got a long wait for we got a, we got a long wait for college football. So we're going to keep putting out podcasts talking about football. This is our last NCAA tournament show. I mean, this is tournament's over i'm ready to move on i, I this yeah. is not our last show talking about um the, the transfer portal i hope we get some more news um on the portal because uh yeah there there's this this team can still be iowa can still be a top 25 team next year i think even say they don't get anybody i think they are a fringe top 25 team with we scant back so i think the biggest one that Fran needs to be focusing right now on besides Robbins is getting Wieskamp to return. If that's what is best for Wieskamp. Um, and if they can do that, then uh, this is a top 25 team next year, but I'm focused on football. Now we've got spring practice, all of the spring press conferences um, will be loaded under our, our YouTube channel. And so you should be able to access those within an hour or less of the completion of each of those news conferences. So um, subscribe to our channel, trying to build the channel from scratch. We appreciate your support. Subscribe to our channel. Of course, we're on Facebook, Twitter. Um, and, uh, again, we're, we're, we're kind of starting this thing from scratch. So it is a challenge, but, uh, all of the spring press conferences from players, coaches, you'll be able to get here on the channel. We do have Iowa players meeting with the media, uh, again, next Tuesday. So expect those press conferences and then also, uh, more, more assistant coaches next week. And I think for the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll have that same routine on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So, Jared, we appreciate you jumping on with us. Anything else you want to add spring football-wise, tournament-wise, Iowa basketball-wise before we wrap this thing up? Um, not that I can think of. Just glad to have the madness back. It was a great tournament. Not for Iowa, but just from a basketball standpoint, it was a great tournament. And, yeah, I'm with you. I'm – I'm living in the moment. I'm I'm enjoying MLB and NBA, but in the back of my head, I'm very excited for September too. So, yeah. I love you know people call me crazy September, and here we're sitting in April eighth. But I mean, no, I know what you mean. I know it, what you mean. It will be one of those things though, where okay, spring practice is going to end this later this month, and you're going to have um, you're going to have May. June, I'm going to be focused on, on the NBA from April to May. Um, and sure. I, you know, I, I know you get into baseball. I don't really get into, to call it to uh, pro baseball. I follow Iowa baseball to a semi um, serious degree. Um, but once we hit June, the countdown really begins because I know that again, there is baseball, but from June and July, those are the two longest months of the year. Now, I will say this, living in Iowa, those are two of my favorite months from a weather standpoint because I love the heat. Um, that's just me. I love warm weather. Things are heading in a decent direction um, as it relates to the virus. We've talked about that. But, yeah, the countdown will soon begin for college football. And uh, it's going to be, a, like I said, a, a – a sharp start to the season with Indiana and Iowa, uh, Indiana and Iowa state. Yeah. And I know, uh, Kirk doesn't love that. Like a couple years ago was the first time they did that, right. Where they started big 10 play before non-conference and yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, isn't that what the non-conference is for? Like, what's the point of going and playing two big games and then playing your right. snowflakes? Right. You know, it's like they get but, Colorado and and or Colorado State, and I believe Kent State and, and Kent State. Yeah, the two games after that. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Indiana got Michael Penix back, and uh, I, I think people maybe are underestimating this Iowa team a bit. Um, I I don't know what to make of Wisconsin. I don't know what to make of the rest of the West. I well, that's he, every year. I mean, it, it is every year, but Wisconsin was down last year. I mean, it. we haven't seen Iowa time. dominate a Wisconsin team. It was pretty dominant performance last year against the Badgers. We haven't seen that in a long time. And I know COVID definitely played a role in some of these things happening, but I just think it's going to be interesting to see. I just, to me, if I look up and down the Big Ten, Iowa has got to be the most balanced team in the, in the West, maybe, maybe behind Wisconsin. Um, just because they're Wisconsin and they know how to be balanced, but uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm excited about it, and uh, we'll keep talking spring football. We appreciate you listening to Week 159 of Brad is Branded Thoughts. Maybe watching here on YouTube or listening through Spotify, through uh, iTunes, through or actually it's not iTunes. I guess te- technically it's transitioned. It's Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Breaker, Anchor. Uh, am I missing any? I'm probably missing some. Wherever you listen to your podcast, you can also access your, uh, our podcast through storycounty.news slash Hawkeye of the Storm. You can access all of our content through storycounty.news and, of course, through our YouTube channel uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Thank you again, Jared. We will talk to you soon. Sounds good. Go Hawks. All right. Go Hawks. This has been week 159 of Brad's Branded Thoughts. We'll talk to you soon.